All right, this morning we're going to talk about the unpardonable sin, what it is and what it isn't. First, we're going to go to Mark chapter 3. We're going to look at the account there in the book of Mark. And we're going to see about what exactly was going on there. All right, Mark chapter 3. Now, we're not going to read the whole chapter, but it would be good if you did sometime if you want to really study the subject well uh, so you can get in the context of the chapter there basically Jesus is uh, healing people and the people even though there's these miraculous signs being presented to them they still do not accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah but look at verse 5 uh, it says here and when he had looked round about on them with love <laughs> no it says anger was Jesus Christ ever angry with the people? Yes, but he had a cause. Okay, something else there to that, but we won't get into that for now. Being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. Now, read down through the context. We're not going to do it for sake of time, but he did this on the Sabbath day. And the Pharisees, which held their traditions above the authority of God's word, this was very highly offensive to the Pharisees because Jesus offended their traditions. Okay, he didn't offend the word of God, but he offended their traditions. And you have a lot of people that are like that today. They'll be offended because you object to their traditions and you do things contrary to their traditions, and their traditions have no basis in Scripture. You should be a Bible-believing Christian and base whatever you do on this book. Okay, because you're going to be judged by this book, not by the traditions of men. But uh, look down at verse 22. It says here, And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. Now right there is the unpardonable sin. We're going to see about that here as we continue. Jump down to verse 28. Verily I say unto you, all sins, now this is Jesus speaking, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation, because they said, he hath an unclean spirit. Okay? Who did they say had an unclean spirit? One of the, one of the disciples? or No, it was Jesus. Jesus was the one that they attacked. Jesus did not say it because they, they said that about Matthew or Mark or John or, or Peter or one of them. He said it because they attacked him personally. Okay, now that's the key to the thing here. Okay, but I want you to notice two things. All right? Number one, who was Jesus speaking to? Pharisees and the Herodians? Scribes. Pharisees and the scribes. Were they saved? No, they were not saved. Okay, did anybody else in the entire Bible ever warn anybody about blaspheming the Holy Ghost? In as far as the unpardonable sin there. Did anybody else ever warn about it? Did you ever read Paul warning anybody about that? No. Jesus Christ was the only one to warn people, and the people that he warned were lost. Okay, keep that in mind. I want to show you here an example of that. Turn to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, verse 5. Okay, here you have Paul speaking. It says here, Acts chapter 18, verse 5, And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. Why didn't he tell them that they committed the unpardonable sin? Never See? Well, different dispensation, yeah, but Jesus wasn't involved here in the in the flesh. Okay, Jesus had to send it back up to heaven, and I'm going to uh, prove all this in just you know as we continue here. But 
I just one of the most interesting things here in this passage is verse six. It says, "When they opposed themselves." You get somebody, oh, don't talk to me about that Jesus stuff. Don't, oh, whatever, you know, you're in your Bible and you're, they're opposing themselves because they're actually resisting the power of the Holy Spirit to convert them so that they can go to heaven. You know, there will be no innocent people in hell. Anybody that makes it to hell is there because they rejected the truth. Okay? They oppose themselves. That's what a lost person does. Now we're going to go to another account of this unpardonable sin. Turn to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12 verse 10. It says, And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. You see, Jesus would allow people to say things about him, himself personally. But when they said that the spirit that's in him is Beelzebub, it's a devil, that was a different story. And we're going to see why with the next account here. Turn to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. Okay, Matthew 12, verse 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Now look at this. Neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now that right there proves the point of what this unpardonable sin is. I believe that the Bible plainly teaches that the unpardonable sin is when somebody actually is physically looking at the Godhead, Jesus Christ being the, the body, God the Father being the soul, and the Holy Ghost being the Spirit. And they look at the Godhead standing right there, and they say, you have a spirit of a devil. That's the unpardonable sin. Okay, the unpardonable sin is not something that can happen today. See, it doesn't say, notice it does not say, neither in this life, neither in eternity. It doesn't say that. The sin that can't be forgiven is it doesn't happen in this world, which is what? Where Jesus is right then. Neither in the world to come. Millennial kingdom. The millennial kingdom. Okay. See, the world that was back then is not going to be the same as the world that will come in the millennial kingdom. But those are the two times that Jesus Christ will be physically present here on the earth. Okay? That's the only way that you can commit this unpardonable sin. Okay? It's never spoken by anybody else. It's only spoken by Jesus Christ, and he never says it to a believer. Okay? It's always to the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Okay? Now, and that's been covered in other messages. I can't get into it here about who the scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees are. But basically, Pharisee, I'll just say it quickly, Pharisee is somebody who holds their traditions above the word of God. A Sadducee is somebody that denies the resurrection. They deny the miracles, the supernatural, which would be your modern liberal. You know, a lot of your modern church Christians are that way. Uh, and the scribe, of course, is the one that's always trying to change the Bible. Okay, and there's plenty of them out there. Those are the three that the Lord attacked. Okay, those were the ones that he constantly was after. And those were the ones that were accusing him of having a spirit of a devil. But I believe that the actual unpardonable sin, it was only ever spoken, warned about by Jesus Christ. And it was only after they had blasphemed him and said that you have a spirit of a devil. But having said that, the actual unpardonable sin is only possible by... You know, when Jesus Christ is physically here on the earth, uh, there's a, a whole movement of charismatics which try to make it this thing where if you make fun of somebody who's doing this speaking in tongues thing, then you've blasphemed the Holy Ghost. There's not one shred of evidence to support that. Not one. Okay, Jesus was not speaking in tongues, you know, when they blasphemed him. 
That's absolutely nonsense. It is a it is a totally made up thing. And I just want to read a quote here. This is from LadderRain.com. And just, just to show you how messed up these people are doctrinally. They say, Have you ever heard a person say that if you speak in tongues you have an evil spirit? That is speaking against the Holy Ghost, but it can also be forgiven. Now notice that right there. Um, if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, Jesus Christ said it can't be forgiven. But they say it can be. So right there you got a problem. But anyhow, I continue here. For a pastor of a church to despise prophecy and forbid the word of the Lord to proceed to the congregation is speaking against the Holy Ghost. Now hold on a second. A pastor that says, you're not going to speak in tongues, he's not stopping the word of the Lord. He's stopping some liar from faking something that doesn't even exist in the Bible. The, in, in the Bible, tongues and languages, they're always known languages. There's never been this blibberty blabberty that you just make up out of your mind. That's a lie. The whole thing's a lie. But see, they twist it around and say, oh, that's the word of the Lord. No, it isn't. And you'll hear this speaking in tongues thing, and it's all about money and uh, health and all kinds of things like that that goes contrary to Scripture. You know, But it's the word of the Lord. See, these people are liars. You really, Just watch out for them. Okay, but it says here, it is a very serious offense to actively oppose the moving of the Spirit, especially if it is being taught as doctrine. Teachers have a greater responsibility to the truth. Well, then I guess I'm in trouble. Uh, we have the same Spirit in us now that Jesus did then. Uh, but you don't have the signs. The signs were given, the signs of the apostles, for the Jews. To confirm the word of the Jews, they rejected, so the signs went away. Uh, let me continue. If this is the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost that the Pharisees committed, then it is the same for us. There can be no other explanation except the accusation that the devil is causing the true manifestation of spiritual gifts and the power to cast out demons. Now I have seen love cover a multitude of sins. Is love enough to cover this type of blasphemy? If you are led by the Lord and hear his voice and speak the truth, you cannot come against spiritual gifts unless you take yourself out of the spirit and speak in the flesh. <laughs> It happens all the time with Christian teachers that have the Spirit, but not in fullness. End of quotation. You know, uh, you know, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Crazy nuttiness is all that is. It, it just doesn't even make sense. Um, and, and by the way, if you want to hear more detail into the whole tongues thing, why it's not scriptural, that what the modern charismatics do, listen to the message on tongues. I can't get into it uh, in real great detail here but i just want to show you something here turn to acts chapter 2 now they said that if you mock somebody who's speaking in tongues if you make fun of them then you've committed the unpardonable sin we think and possibly you can be forgiven we think but uh we're not sure if it was in the spirit or if you left the spirit and you're in the flesh or you know <laughs> whatever Jesus said, if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, it won't be forgiven. Okay? So they just messing it all up. Acts chapter 2. We're not going to read the whole thing, but you look down there, chapter 1, or sorry, verse 1 down through about verse 15. And we'll look at verse 13 here. It says, Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. Now, the very first time that tongues shows up, you have the languages listed there. In verses uh, 8 through 11, you have all the languages listed where, where the early Christians were speaking in these tongues, these languages. Okay, both words are used there. Tongues is just an, a, another name for language. Okay, it's not some magical thing. Okay, you have the, the languages listed. Verse 13, it says that they mocked them and they said they were drunk, basically. Look at what Peter says. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye have blasphemed the Holy Ghost, and you will never be forgiven. He didn't say that. He said, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. And he goes on to preach to them, and three thousand get saved. There is no unpardonable sin there mentioned. Why? Because Jesus Christ is not physically present. Okay? Do not fall for that. But you say, well, 
well, why would they use this then? Why? What would be the purpose? You know, one of the best things to do whenever you see somebody using and twisting scripture is say, what's the motivation behind that? Why would they do it? Money, yeah. Yeah. But what's the motivation behind the charismatic Pentecostal movement of this warning people about blaspheming the Holy Ghost? Fear. And guess what? One of the best things that you can use to control humanity is fear. And they teach that you can blaspheme the Holy Ghost, but somehow mag magically you can be forgiven of it, even though that's not what the Bible says. And they teach, secondly, that you can lose your salvation. Now that is what Catholicism has taught from the very beginning. Those are both Catholic philosophies, and that's how they control their people. They, you know, I have a book, I don't have it here with me this morning, but I have a book written by the Jesuits in my collection. And they have over, I think it's over 200 something curses, anathemas in there. If any man believes this, let him be anathema. If any man teaches it, let him be anathema. Over 200 curses. Why? To keep the people in line. If you say you're saved by faith alone, you're damned to hell according to Roman Catholicism. You know, they can they can threaten you and they can keep you in line by saying that you can lose your salvation unless you do what they say. You know, and keep your giving up. That's important too. So, you know, like I said, listen to the tongues message for more information. Now, second part of the message here this morning is, is it possible today to commit a sin that you can't be forgiven of? Well, yes and no. Turn to John chapter 8. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 8, verse 21. Okay, we read, Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whither I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he saith, Whither I go, ye cannot come. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you, That ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, Ye shall die in your sins. Okay? If you reject Jesus Christ throughout your whole life, you will die in your sins, and when you die in your sins, you can't be forgiven. Forgiveness ends when you take your last breath. Okay, now up until that point, you can get saved. There's no point in your life where God says, okay, that's it, you're done. No, you can still repent of those sins, and it is repentance, by the way. There's a lot of false prophets out there today that are just saying believe and receive, and that's all there is to it. No, it's a life change. Okay, and the lost world knows that. That's why they don't get saved. Because <laughs> they don't want to change their lives. All right, don't fall for that either. So, can you commit an unpardonable sin? Well, when you take your last breath, you have committed the unpardonable sin. <laughs> okay, but now, let me show you here quick. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. And I'll show you this thing about you can be forgiven no matter what you've done. You know, one other error that's out there is this thing of lordship salvation, which is that you have to uh, clean up your life and be sinless before you can be saved. Well, that's also heretical. Uh, we don't teach that. Second uh, Peter chapter three verse nine says, "The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance." God, it's not ever God's will for anybody to go to hell. Contrary to what Calvinism teaches. Okay, There's no such thing as non-elect in, in terms of salvation. All right, You can get saved. Anybody can get saved. And it doesn't matter what you've done. Salvation is a fresh start. It's you put your sins under the blood and the blood's there to wash them away. And the blood is capable of washing any sin away, by the way. Okay? Turn to Romans chapter 1, verse 28. 
we're going to see this uh, again. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. There is a point in time, yes, God will save you, you know, up until the very last minute. But I will say this, there is a point in time where you kind of go over to the side of you're not going to get saved. You see, human beings have something very peculiar about them, and that is we have this thing called a habit. And you get into the habit of doing something, it's very difficult to break a habit. Very difficult. Ask somebody that smokes. Ask somebody that drinks. Ask somebody that looks at pornography. Ask somebody that whatever. You know, you can form a habit very quickly as a human being. And guess what? You can form a habit of denying Jesus Christ. And you do it and you do it and you do it. At first it seems kind of like, oh boy, uh, there's a little bit of fear there. You hear that message of salvation for the first time. You, oh man, you start sweating and oh, this is going to mean I'm, I'm going to lose my family. I'm going to lose my friends. I'm not ready yet. And at first, you know, you're probably upset about it for a day or so. But then the next time you do it, it gets a little bit easier. Then it gets a little bit easier and a little easier, a little easier. And pretty soon, God says, "Okay, I'm going to turn you over to a reprobate mind." Why? Because you didn't like to retain God in your knowledge. You know what's wrong with this world? People don't want to think about God. Look at YouTube. <laughs> Look at the Internet. Okay, what are the number one searches right now on Google or things like that? Lindsay Lohan, Mel Gibson. I forget what... I just heard this. I'm not making this up. This is actually true. You know, uh, what the, the, the basketball player that just went over to the thing, you know. And it's funny because I actually heard a report on this and a guy said... Like number five or number six is the oil spill in the Gulf. People are more concerned about celebrities right now than they are about a major environmental catastrophe in the Gulf. You know, they're more concerned about some slut in Hollywood having drug problems. You know, absolutely ridiculous. But let's continue here. All lost people, everybody that's ever lost, will blaspheme the Lord in one of three ways. Okay, we're going to look at the first way here. Turn back in your Old Testament, way back towards the beginning, to Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 24. And I'm going to show you an example of the first type of blasphemy. Okay, the, one of the ways that you can blaspheme the Lord and, and end up in hell is by mocking God and cursing His name. Uh, Leviticus chapter 24, verse 10. And the son of an Israelitish woman whose father was an Egyptian went out among the children of Israel, and this son of the Israelitish woman and a man of Israel strove together in the camp. And the Israelitish woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. And they brought him unto Moses, and his mother's name was Shelameth, the daughter of Dibri the, of the tribe of Dan, and they put him in ward, that the mind of the Lord might be showed unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Bring forth him that hath cursed without the camp, and let all that heard him lay their hands upon his head, and let all the congregation stone him. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Whosoever curseth his God shall bear his sin. That's interesting there. Verse 16, And he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death, and all the congregation shall certainly stone him, as well the stranger as he that is born in the land, when he blasphemeth the name of the Lord, shall be put to death. You know, people say, oh, that's so harsh. What a horrible thing. Yeah, but I bet you it was a lot more pure back then than it is today. You know, my I was over at my younger sister's place last night, and she was saying that she was walking around a grocery store. It's owned by Mennonites. You know, it's not like a, some kind of Walmart or something like that. And she said there was a young girl walking around on her cell phone using the F word. Women and children walking around. What's the problem? No fear of God. 
None whatsoever. And, you know, you go back 100 years ago, people were real careful what they said. They'd call the Bible the good book, you know. They'd, they'd talk about God and, you know, they even the most hard-hearted sinner back then was very careful that they did not blaspheme the Lord. Now, it's a joke. It's funny. Richard Dawkins, the atheist over there in England, actually had a contest online that if you would go make a video for YouTube blaspheming God, that you'd get a free book. One of his, his books, The God Delusion. He'd send you a free book if you'd make a video blaspheming the Lord. You know? And people were doing it. Lots of people were doing it. See, we're at this point right here. And the people are not being killed. They're not being executed. But God's wrath is going to be poured out soon. Okay? So they're not getting away with it. Okay? Every, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. You know, they will give account. But I just want to, I want you to notice three things here real quick. Number one, verse 10 there says that this boy, that his mother was an Israelitish woman and his father was an Egyptian. Now, the Israelites were told not to even go down to Egypt. And so what's she do? She marries an Egyptian. Uh, big problem. Okay? There's a big problem there. Uh, another thing I want you to, no to notice is verse 11. It gives her name. It gives who her father is and the tribe that she's a part of. Recorded for all of eternity. That's not a real good thing. <laughs> to be a woman and to be recorded for all of eternity as being a rotten mother and that her son blasphemed the name of the Lord. Also very bad. But look at verse 15. It says, Whosoever curseth his God shall bear his sin. Now what happens to you if you bear your own sin? You go to hell. Okay? The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If your sins are on yourself, you're going to go to hell. If your sins are on Jesus Christ, you'll go to heaven. Okay? His righteousness is imputed to you. All right, now let's go to Psalm 14. You know, Christians right now are really, really... You know, the, the lost world is really going after Christianity and they're, and they're trying to whittle down our final authority... They're trying to whittle down the fact that we have absolute truth. They hate the idea of absolute truth. And one of the things I want to talk about here is right here in Psalm 14, verse 1 through 3. It says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. How many people do you think today would agree with that statement? Oh, I don't know. My neighbor's an atheist and he's not a bad guy. You know, he helped me bring in my groceries in one week. I think he's a pretty nice guy and I, you know, he's a good citizen and stuff. No, he's not good. He's a fool. He's abominable. Okay? We need to take our stand by the Bible. Okay, you yeah, you should you should be kind to somebody. Don't go over and punch them in the face if they're an atheist or something. But you have to realize you have to look at them the way God looks at them. Let's continue on here. Verses 2 and 3. It says, The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. That's what the loving God up in heaven thinks of humanity. And the only reason he has anything to do with any of us is if you're covered in the blood of Jesus Christ and his righteousness is imputed to you. If you're not under the blood, God doesn't think anything about you. And all your good little works and everything else mean nothing at all. Okay? Let's continue on here. Turn to the very last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 16. And we're going to see here what's going to be happening in the very near future. I would say that these events are going to be taking place probably within the next 10 to 20 years. Probably less than that. But we are moving rapidly towards this. The way people's attitude is turned against God, 
Just amazing. Revelation chapter 16, verse 8 through 11. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and asked forgiveness from God. No. And blasphemed the name of God, which had power, hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. Look over at verse 21. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Now that is the most one of the most amazing things to read and to, and to actually come to the realization they're going to have the Bible. And the Bible is going to tell them exactly what's coming after this. We just had this plague here, the hail stones mingled with blood, you know, and fire. And they can look and they can see what's coming up next. The Bible will be, will be confirmed in this time of Jacob's trouble, this tribulation period. You would think that they would turn to God. But they don't. They blaspheme God and they don't repent. Absolutely amazing. The Bible's true. There are things happening on the earth that they can't explain by quote-unquote science. <laughs> Oppositions of science falsely so-called. They can't explain it. And yet they still don't turn. And you see that same thing with Jesus Christ performing miracles, raising the dead, healing the lepers, you know, fixing up a man's hand, and yet they don't repent. You see the same thing going on. Just absolutely amazing how hardened people are becoming. Turn to Second Timothy chapter three, verses one through five. You say, well, you know, I mean, there are actually Christians out there that say that they don't think we're in the last days. <laughs> I just, I can't imagine that. You know. I mean, you must be almost spiritually dead to, to not believe we're in the last days. But look at Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. It says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Hmm. Hate crime legislation? Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Isn't that interesting? Is there one thing in that list that's not in abundance in our modern day society? No. All of those things exist and people are committing all of those things. The majority of the people. Okay? We are in the last days. So the first way that people blaspheme God is by mocking Him and cursing His name. By blaspheming the God of heaven. Okay? Turn to 1 John chapter 5. We're going to look at the second way. 1 John chapter 5, verse 10. The second way that people, the reason that they go to hell through blasphemy is because they blaspheme the word of God, the written word of God. Now, look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 10. It says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. You know, for the last hundred or so years, uh, dating back actually to the late 1800s, you had the whole Oxford movement, you had German rationalism coming into the churches, and you had this thing of higher textual criticism. And they, you know, big terms here this morning, you know, get ready. But uh, naturalistic textual criticism. Now, what does that mean? That means that most of the Bible scholars today view the Bible as a man made book. It's not supernatural, it's just a man made book, which means. We can change it. We can update it. We can mess around with the words. The warnings in there about don't add to or don't take away from, those are just written by men. So we can change it all we want. That's the way the majority of Christian, 
Christianity, professing Christianity, not real Christianity, but professing Christianity, that's the way most of them believe. And what happens when you believe that way is you make God a liar. <coughs> hey, is this book God's word? Well, no, I don't think it. Then God's a liar. That's what you're saying. That's what you say when you're denying this book. You're saying this record here, this written word of God is a lie. Okay? And yet they still call it God's word, which is really weird. Verse 11, And this is the record that God gave, hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Okay, God gave you a written record of your salvation. Okay, now turn next to Titus chapter 2, verse 5. And I'm actually working on a video right now. I'm going to be putting it up on YouTube here, Lord willing, probably this coming week. I've been working on the format now for a while. But it's very sad. The lost world is actually starting to pick up on this higher textual criticism thing. And now the Islamic world especially is starting to laugh at Christianity and say, your own scholars are saying that the Bible's not true. Your own, your own theologians are saying that the Bible contains errors. And yet you tell us that the Koran is wrong. We only have one Koran. You have 80 new versions. You know? And more than 80. It's actually a lot more than that. But you know what the sad thing is? They're right. They're absolutely right. How do you defend this stuff? See, the only one that can really truly answer a Muslim is a King James Bible believer. If you use and believe in any translation, whatever you prefer, you can't answer a Muslim. Unless you lie to them, which is what most people do. Oh, well, all the translations say the same thing. No, they don't. No, they don't. I mean, even just a, a you know, take a fifth grader. They could read it and say it doesn't say the same thing. Okay? But... Let's continue on here. Titus chapter 2, verse 5. Speaking here about women, verses 3 through 5. And it says, To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. If you're a bad example, if you are a, you know, there are a lot of women out there that are bad, and you can actually cause the word of God to be blasphemed. People will mock the word of God because of your of you being a stumbling block. Okay, turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1. So there's a little bit of uh, warning for the wives and the women out there. But now we'll look at another warning here, which is directed at men. But it says here, uh, 1 Timothy 6, 1 says, Let as many servants as are under the yoke. Now, technically you're not if you're employed, but you know. You're not a servant under the yoke, sort of. <laughs> but it says, uh, Count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. You know, that can happen. If you're a Christian and your employer is lost, and he knows you're a Christian, if you're a rotten worker, what's he going to attack? He won't attack you personally. He'll attack the Bible. And it, he'll attack Christianity. So be careful how you work. Okay, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Romans 10, 17. Very familiar passage. Here it says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in the Bible. Eh, I don't think so. No, something doesn't sound right there. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 1 John 5, 10 through 13 says that your salvation is based on written record. Okay? Don't claim to be a Christian and then turn around and say you don't believe the word of God. That's a big problem. Okay, first way that you can blaspheme is by cursing God and mocking his name. Second way is by blaspheming the word of God, by saying that this book is a lie. Okay, that's another way that people will go to hell. And the third way is uh, we're going to look in Isaiah chapter 65. The third way is when people do their own thing and claim that it is worship. 
for God. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 7. God requires a certain way that you worship Him. And He has, you know, He's not going to back down on that. Okay, Isaiah chapter 65, verse 7. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills, therefore will I measure their former work into their bosom. Okay, go to Ezekiel chapter 20. We'll go there quick. Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 27 through 31. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 27. Therefore, son of man, speak unto the house of Israel, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Yet in this your fathers have blasphemed me, and that they have committed a trespass against me. For when I had brought them into the land, for the which I lifted up my hand, mine hand to give it to them, then saw they every high hill and all the thick trees, and they offered there their sacrifices. And there they presented the provocation of their offering. There also they made their sweet savor and poured out there their drink offerings. Then I said unto them, What is the high place whereunto ye go? And the name thereof is called Bema unto this day. Wherefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Are ye polluted after the manner of your fathers, and commit ye whoredoms after their abominations? For when ye offer your gifts, when ye make your sons to pass through the fire, ye pollute yourselves with all your idols, even unto this day. And shall I be inquired of by you, O house of Israel? As I live, saith the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. God does not accept worship that is based on paganism. You say, well, what was the big deal there? What was the problem? Well, can't they worship out in the forest? No, you can worship out in the forest, but it's the way that they were doing it. They were going up just like the heathen do. They go up into the high places and they find a grove of trees and then there they put their altar or they put their idol or something like that. And this still goes on today, by the way. Uh, see the Bohemian Grove thing. Look that up. But uh, they were doing this and they were claiming that it was their way of worshiping the Lord. God said, no, I want you to do it this way. They said, no, we want to be like the pagans. We want to be like the heathen. But we'll just give it a a spiritual flavor, you know. And it's interesting because that's what the modern church has become here in America. They take paganism, they take what is of the devil, and they say we're going to Christianize it. And then we're going to use it to worship the Lord. You see, back when I was young, this Christian rock movement was really getting underway. And they were saying, we're doing this so we can win the lost. And you say, well, you're not going to bring it into the church, are you? Oh, no, no, no. This is just to evangelize the lost. And then they brought it into the church. Why? Because it's flesh. It's more exciting to the flesh. That's why they do it. Okay? Now, I just want to say something here. You can turn to John chapter 4, verse 23 through 24. While we're turning there, let me just give you a little something to think about here. What if your birthday was coming up and you were going to have it, you know, at one of your relatives' places and you got there and they said, you walked in, your whole family's there and they said, happy birthday. Now for a special birthday surprise to honor you, we're going to bring in some strippers and we're going to play some rap music very, very loud and we're all going to sit around and, and do heroin. Would you be honored by that? No. Well, what if they said, well, we're going to play loud music and we're going to have a bunch of immodestly dressed women up on a stage, and we're going to have lights flashing. Would you be honored by that? No. If you had any sense, you wouldn't be. <laughs> Why do you think God would be honored by these modern churches doing that? They don't have strippers yet. <laughs> they don't have drugs yet. But they have the lights. They have the loud music. Go outside of one of these big modern churches sometime, if you don't believe me. Maybe you're part of one. You need to get out of it if you are. But go outside one of these big modern churches. It sounds like a bar. You know? Do you think God is honored by that? No. He's not. What are they doing? They're taking pagan practices and pagan ways 
and they're trying to say this is for the Lord. And God, what did God say back there in Ezekiel? He said, "Shall I be inquired of you? Are you are you going to pray to me? Are you going to expect me to answer your prayers?" And what did God say? He said, "No, no, I won't be inquired of you. You aren't going to pray to me for anything." Okay, but now here in John chapter four, verse twenty-three, I'm going to show you what Jesus Christ said about worship. John chapter 4 verse 23 says, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Spirit, or shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now you ought to pay attention when the Lord says things twice. He's very emphatic about that. You see that in Galatians chapter 1. We just went over that in our Bible study this past week where Paul said about if any man comes and preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preaches another gospel, he said it twice. Jesus said it twice here. If you want to worship God, you worship him in spirit and in truth. Is that what the modern church does? No. They worship him in flesh and in feelings. <laughs> they could care less about absolute truth. And they don't like the spirit. They pretend they do, you know. But it's flesh. Okay, that's what the, the modern music is all about. That's what the whole thing is about. All right? And why do you think they have the women up there on the stage, by the way? Uh, it's about flesh. It's not in spirit and it's not in truth. But now I'm going to play a real quick clip for you here. I saw this while I was going through it and I thought I need to kind of answer this. Um... Here we have a false prophet that needs to be rebuked. John Hagee. Listen to what he says. I'm delighted to present my latest book, In Defense of Israel. This book will expose the sins of the fathers and the vicious abuse of the Jewish people. In Defense of Israel will shape Christian theology. It scripturally proves that the Jewish people as a whole did not reject Jesus as Messiah. It will also prove that Jesus did not come to earth to be the Messiah. It will prove that there was a Calvary conspiracy between Rome, the high priest and Herod, to execute Jesus as an insurrectionist too dangerous to live. Since Jesus refused by word and deed to claim to be the Messiah, how can the Jews be blamed for rejecting what was never offered? Okay, that's about enough of that. That guy is a lying <clears throat> devil, and I'm going to prove it. Look at verse 25 there, John chapter 4, verse 25. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Verse 26, Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. John Hagee just said that Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. He lied. Well, what's the deal? John Hagee teaches that the King James Bible is not God's perfect word. He teaches that there is no perfect Bible. So you see, he disarmed the Christians in his congregation. He took their Bible from them, and now he can deceive them. Okay, that's how they do it. John Hagee's a liar. Just proved it right there. Jesus was the Messiah. Okay, is the Messiah. Turn to John chapter 14. A couple more places here, then we're done. John chapter 14. Verse 15 through 17. Okay. Uh, verse 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. The Spirit of Truth is the Holy Ghost. And it says there, Whom the world cannot receive. So why would you build a building and fill it with saved and lost people? Unscriptural. And you get a bunch of saved or lost people standing in a church building somewhere singing about, you know, uh, singing Christian songs that talk about being saved. And they're deceived into thinking that they're now a Christian. See, the modern church 
the more and more I look at it, the more and more I examine it. It's just, it's not of the Lord. And it's actually quite wicked. And guess what? It produces the absolute worst type of individual. So you get some guy out on the street who struggles with alcohol and he struggles with whatever and he's just lost and he's miserable and he has no peace. And he knows, I should. I wonder if there is a God. I, want, I wish I knew if there was a place called heaven and things. You can witness to somebody like that. But you get some modern professing Christian that goes to some big church building and they, where they blend paganism with Christian terminology, you got somebody there that's not going to be listening to the gospel. And they will blaspheme God every time they go to their church and they sing their rock music and they listen to the, or they read from their new versions and they talk about all the false doctrine that's in the modern churches and they blaspheme the Lord and blaspheme the Lord and blaspheme the Lord and they end up going to hell when they die. And that's what the majority of America is right now. Okay, turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. Ephesians 5, 8 through 10 says, But for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. They say, well, God doesn't have preferences. Whatever you feel like doing, wrong. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. The King James Bible is acceptable unto the Lord. The old hymns are acceptable unto the Lord. Modest dress standards are acceptable unto the Lord. Those are all things that are offensive to the modern Christian. All three of those things. If you are a true Christian, the fruit of the Spirit is it all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Jesus Christ, by the way, John fourteen six, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is the truth. So how can you say that you are saved and yet reject the truth and hate the truth? There's a big problem there. But now you say, well, I'm, I'm guilty of these things, you know, and, and what do I do? I guess I've blasphemed and now I'm lost. Well, let's look about that. And this is where we're going to finish. First Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 16. Here you have Paul writing to Timothy. He says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. You can be forgiven for blaspheming the word of God, for blaspheming God himself, or for blaspheming God through pagan types of ways of worship okay if you're in that system and you're doing it ignorantly then you need to get out okay now if you listen to this message you're no longer ignorant you've seen the scriptures that you're to worship the lord in spirit and in truth you need to get out of that but if you continue you're gonna have problems you're gonna have big problems you're not going to be guilty of the unpardonable sin Okay, that's not possible unless Jesus is physically present. But if you continue to blaspheme the Lord with the way you're living, things are not going to go too well for you. And it's going to be bad at the, at the judgment seat of Christ. So that's it for this morning. Uh, if you want to kind of see a lot of this stuff uh, really spelled out great, the hymn that we sang this morning really kind of says a lot. Uh, it's who is on the Lord's side. Get an old hymnal sometime and read that hymn. The words in it are excellent. And uh, that really kind of spells out what I was trying to get through this morning. If you're going to be on the Lord's side, you're not going to be on the world's side. And that's the whole thing. 
Okay. So that's it for this morning. Thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.